Am I loving Jesus more than anything and anyone? Or is my ego still the one who has the final say in certain areas of life? See, that, that was sort of running through my mind. I don't know what your week has been like, because so I'm not going to tell you what my week was like. So I'll keep my... No. Anyway, um, and so what went through my head just now was just this. Who is in ultimate charge of our lives? And I'm not talking about the, the huge decisions. No, the small decisions. Because life is a collection of small decisions interrupted by punctual large events and decisions. But the bread and butter of our lives, the, the average uh, occurrence uh, and, and situations of our lives are not really that major. It's a lot of small stuff. But a lot of small stuff together is still accumulating to life of some considerable amount. And so who is in charge when we make those small decisions in life? And your small decisions may be different from mine. But the mechanics are the same. Is it my ego that is in charge and has the final say? No, everybody else and everything else, yep, yeah, uh, of course, you know, I'm, I follow the Lord and I bless God. But, and, and, but, but he doesn't have the last say. He can speak and then when he's finished speaking, then I will speak. Or is it the other way around in our lives? That I, okay, Lord, this is what I want, but not as I wish. Instead of, instead, how do you want to see this thing go through? How would you like me to decide? Am I like John the Baptist and say on Monday afternoon, you, Lord, must increase? I must decrease. That's what I mean. That's the, when you strip it all away, it is that, 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 that internal struggle between the Holy Spirit and my ego, who's in final and ultimate control. And so hopefully sometime during these moments that we spend together and um, look in the word, hopefully we will leave here with a renewed with a renewed um, desire that the answer to that question is more like John the Baptist and not like some other characters that we find in the Bible who did not say he must increase and I must decrease but sort of switched that thing around. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks brother for that song. Appreciated that, Brother Freeman. Although it took me slightly off course just now. <laughs> and I'm frantically thinking we've got a pastor in the house as well so how do I homiletically sort of catch the curve around well there is no really sometimes you just have to stop and um, say okay well let's switch track and I'm mixing up my illustrations as well as well jumping from cars to trains and before I even dig myself deeper into that hole um, today we're going to conclude what we started at the beginning of last month amen I saw you say yes so tonight, today we're going to finish this, hopefully. Let us pray. Lord, I must decrease because you have to increase. So be lifted up, dear Jesus, and draw all people to yourself. And speak to us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last month, of course, was Black History Month, and we would have concluded in the second um, on my second time here during the month, which was the third Sabbath of the, of the month. But it, had it not been for that pesky little event on the 14th of February, plus I said I think it was not quite, the, the, the sun was still cooking, I hadn't finished yet. And so we were sort of more Valentine-ish oriented two weeks ago. Never mind, it's 1st of March, but we pretend it's still February. And February, of course, as we learned at the beginning of the month, is Black History Month, and we will not shy away from that issue in this church. Yes. <laughs> Although some may think that maybe we should be like, uh, uh, more like um, 
uh, Morgan Freeman, who, who in an interview said that he doesn't think Black History Month is a good idea because black history is American history. And so we shouldn't single out a particular part of history and, um, and, 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 and like split it away from, from the rest of, of history. Thank you. But instead, we should celebrate history in its fullness. And that is a laudable uh, way of looking at it. But I mentioned my, my reasons um, four weeks ago that if there is an imbalance in how history has been presented, then maybe we should take some time and emphasize that which up to now has been underexposed and try to lift it up so that now, hopefully, eventually, everything is on the same level. Are you still with me? Because when the Bible says in Amos, um, four, uh, in Amos 5, verse 24, that let justice roll like a river and righteousness like a never-ceasing stream, I believe God doesn't just talk about spiritual issues there. Hmm, yes, because the book of Amos is more to, has more social justice in it than, than, than some of us wish it had. But it is in the Bible, it is there. It is part of the, of the canon, it's part of our Bible. And we like to quote Amos when we say, well, you know, if, if we test the prophet, then he has to agree with the law and the testaments, otherwise because there's no light in them. So we like to quote Amos, yes, but we sort of skip over the other bits. That may not um, suit our... Us, us too well. But if God is a God of justice and righteousness and his justice, his sense of fairness is not limited just to how he treats us as spiritual beings, how he treats us as a sinful person offering us salvation. If his justice and his sense of fairness doesn't stop there, then neither should ours. Or should I go to James? James has some very if you are um, in the income bracket that I sometimes dream I was, then James has some very choice words for you. And that's the New Testament. Paul also writes to his young associate in 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 6. He has some, some words, that, and that's not about his spirituality. That talks about how he deals with money, what is his attitude to, to wealth. God is a God of justice and righteousness that includes more than our spiritual state. And so if there is an injustice in the way we relate history one to another... And God is a God of justice and fairness, and we are his children, then we cannot continue and, 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 and um, perpetuate historical fraud because now we are God's children. And if he loves justice, then so should we. And so if history has been told in a um, somewhat bleached fashion, then we ought to embrace things like Black History Month because those things exist to readdress the balance. You can say amen to that, don't worry. And I'm, this is not a history lesson. This is trying to help us understand who God is, that he is much greater, he is much bigger than, than we often think he is. And he cannot be limited to our understanding. And even if some of us feel uncomfortable and may even feel slightly offended by what I just said, well, excuse me, God is larger than even my thoughts. And if we have neglected to tell the story of African Americans correctly, and if we've run away from the um, crucial part that European Americans played in this whole sad story, well, then events like Black History Month remind us that we have some catching up to do. There is a word in German that um, rather than explaining, I put on the screen, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Can we say it again? Vergangenheitsbewältigung. 25 characters. And I was joking about this last week in Mount Holly that I will try to be, to not use as many minutes in the sermon as this word has letters, but I failed. Vergangenheitsbewältigung is a German composite noun 
two words, Vergangenheit, which means that which is past or history, that's the first bit there, Vergangenheit, the German V is pronounced with an F, so that's why I said Vergangenheit and not Vergangenheit, Vergangenheit, and Bewältigung, the second part of the word with the two dots as well, Bewältigung means to come to terms with something or to wrestle with something. To, to, to digest something, just to, to deal with something. So, taken together, Vergangenheitsbewältigung is the struggle with or the coming to terms with history, with something that was past. Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Now, I'm not going to try and um, con you know, distract you from, from what I'm saying by having this up there, although maybe we should leave it for a little while while I deal with this. To, to give you a little background to this, let me read to you how Wikipedia, an online lexicon, how Wikipedia describes Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Vergangenheitsbewältigung is a composite German word that describes processes of dealing with the past, which is perhaps best rendered in English as, quote, struggle to come to terms with the past. It is a key term in the study of post-1945 German literature and culture. And this is where it gets interesting, because while I, as a German-born person, have very little in terms of American history to tell my American congregation, I can very much relate to you what my experience was in terms of this in my personal and nation's history. And who knows, maybe, just maybe, speaking about Black History Month, maybe, just maybe, there's something in there that we as Americans can also learn. Maybe. So Vergangenheitsbewältigung describes the attempt to analyze, to digest, and to learn to live with the past. In, partic in particular, the Holocaust, talking about German history now. The focus on learning is much in the spirit of philosophers George Santanaya, oft quoted observation, is that his name? Santayana, Santayana, who said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who cannot, and I add to that, who won't or don't want to remember the past are condemned to repeat it. As a technical term in English, it relates specifically to the atrocities committed during the Third Reich when Adolf Hitler was in power in Germany and to concerns about the extensive compromise and co-optation of many German cultural, religious and political institutions by the Nazis. The term therefore deals at once with the concrete responsibility of the German state Footnote, West Germany assumed the legal, the legal obligations of the Third Reich after the war. And footnote, and of individual Germans for what took place under Hitler and with questions about the roots of legitimacy in a society that invented the Enlightenment yet then collapsed in the face of Nazi ideology. What does this all mean? It means that Vergangenheitsbewältigung for a German is to come to terms with what happened in our country between the years 1933 and 1945. What happened with, between the election of Adolf Hitler as Reichs, uh, as, uh, um, Reichs Chancellor and the utter complete destruction of the German state and the discovery of the uh, concentration camps and the um, 60 million people dead across the world at the end of World War II. That's Vergangenheitsbewältigung. And unlike Americans and English and French and, 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 and British, I mean, and French, who were the allies on the winning side, we Germans can't look back at that and say, well, didn't we do well? Because Abba was right. The winner takes it all, the loser standing small. That includes of how we look at history. If you're on the losing side of history, it was your people that built, designed, I mean, labored over put brain power into how can we quickly and effectively and efficiently dispose with the maximum amount of bodies in a given time. There were German engineers trying to sort that out. If you are on the part of the people that did that, 
Then you can't back and then you can't look back on 1933 to 45 and say, well, didn't we do well? No, you have to do this. You have to come to terms with your past. I'm going here. I'm going with this. I'm going somewhere with this. And coming to terms with my past, I had to. When I was a teenager, I went to a European pathfinder camp. So here were Adventist young people, Christian young people coming from all over Europe, meeting in the south of France in a camboree, a bit like what happens this year in Oshkosh in Wisconsin. Only wasn't quite that many. And yet here I was with my German fellow German pathfinders and we had these very distinct type of tents so you can always tell where the Germans are because we had these really sturdy rough looking tents. You know, because we like to rough it, not no, that uh, luxury. No, if you go camping, man, you have to. Anyway, so there we were. And I became very quickly distinctly aware of the fact that I was German because of the comments from some of the non-German young people. And you, in those days, maybe it's different now, but that was in the early 80s. Um, so, you're from Germany, aren't you? All right, good. And it, it won't take five minutes before at least some smart person will come up with a joke about Hitler or the Nazis. And it makes sound funny to somebody who's not German, but when you grew up in Germany and you had to deal with this, when you had to read the history books and you think, well, that was my grandparents' generation who did this. This was my grandfather's colleagues in the armed forces who herded Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and communists onto the trains to ship them not outside of the country into some foreign land where they can then live the rest of their days. No, to ship them to a camp that had been created to kill them. Those were my people who did that. You can't listen to jokes like that and feel like, oh, that's funny. Although to try and ease the tension, that's how my, that was my reaction. And so it came, became so bad that there were moments when I tried to speak English in the presence of non-Germans just to hide the fact that I was a German. But the problem was that my German accent in my English was so thick that if you knew just a little bit of English, You know, you can't hide. Even now, it's, it's always there because it's the mother tongue. You cannot hide it. I layered on top of that a layer of British English. And that's all the layers that I uh, plan to put on there. So, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not talking New Jersey in English anywhere, anytime soon. So, if that is your hope, that well, we're going to... You know, in five years we have him talking properly. No, no, forget that. Just, 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 just forget about that right now. In five years' time, I will sound just like, just as British German as I'm sounding now. And when I get excited, I'm still gonna swallow my teas. So, um, anyway, I'm digressing. And I had to come to terms with what happened in my country where I was born. The passport of which I'm still carrying 21 years before I was born I wasn't there I never denounced anybody to their arrest and subsequent death I didn't vote for any of those goons and fools I didn't do none of that that was that was before my time and yet when people saw me they saw somebody who belongs to the people who did it. And I had to come to terms with this. There was no way of denying it. There was no way to run away from it. I had to come to terms with it. And history, and even up to now, when I watch the History Channel, it's interesting. The amount of time that British and American television spend on looking at German history, it helps me to still do this. It's great. But now let me switch this around a bit. Because to the same extent that I learn about my people's history, I miss 
the same exposure, the same analysis and digestion, the same confession about their own history. And this is what brings me back to Black History Month. See, today we're going to talk about Vergangenheitsbewältigung on three levels. And I'm not going to take too much time on either of them, because like I said, there are 25 letters in this word, and I'll try to be less than two minutes per letter. Because <laughs> one minute has already done now. Almost. The, th the first level is where we started out. Black History Month is a national institution now to highlight the contribution and the history of black Americans or African Americans. And when I say that there is something missing in the telling of history, I mean this. Yes, we all realize that in the beginning of this nation, there was slavery and there was genocide and there was violence and exploitation and not all things went well. Wait a second, is that really what I read in the books? Is that really how the uh, Pilgrim Fathers and their descendants are portrayed as they land in Plymouth Rock and they establish their so-called free um, colony, yet persecute those who don't believe exactly as they did? And we haven't even reached this point yet where there was the mid-transatlantic the, the, the um, slave trade in full swing. We haven't even been there yet. I've learned through this process to talk about my nation's history without any feelings of guilt and with a manageable amount of shame. I'm saying that because this process, which we're going to look at on three levels, right? Starting with country first, then we'll go to church, and then we'll go to personal. So just so you know where I'm heading with this. I've come to the conclusion that I first have to acknowledge that what happened, happened, and that me or my group was directly involved and responsible for it. As a German, I cannot run away from the fact I could deny, I could say, well, we didn't do it. And if I said that loud enough in Germany, I would, I would get arrested because you're not allowed to deny German history in, in Germany. It's a capital, it, it, it's, it's a, um, what you call it, it's an offense. Same way, you, you, you cannot um, wear Nazi insignia. Uh, And all that, that's all, that's all, that's, we, we, you know, you're not allowed to do that under the law. First Amendment doesn't stretch to that, not when you have the history of my people. So I had to acknowledge that it happened. I had to acknowledge, Joe, that this was my people. I was not part of the victim group. I couldn't claim that, well, maybe my, 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 my people were, were, were Jews, and so, they were, and so they, were, um, they were persecuted. So I now stand on the victim side, and I have the moral high ground. Look at what they did to us during the Nazi um, time, how they persecuted us, how they gassed all our relatives, and so forth. That's on the victim side. But the problem with my personal history is that I'm not there. My grandparents served in the German army. My family is German. There's nothing else in there. I don't have the voting records. I have no idea what they voted in 1932, 1933. But these were my, these were my German people who did it. I'm part of that group. See, the problem with Vergangenheitsbewältigung is it's not a pain-free process. And because as human beings we like to avoid pain, right? If I held a, a lighter to your hand now, yeah, you would move your hand away because, you, you know, only if there's something wrong would you like enjoy that. You know, like, no, we, we avoid pain and so to deal with your, your history is painful, especially when it's shameful. 
So Black History Month teaches me, a white person, that I have to look at the complete picture of history, identify what happened, and not deny the fact that it was people like me, people who emigrated from even my own country in the 1890s and whenever, moved to this country and may have been part of segregation, of Jim Crow, of pointing at African Americans and says, we don't want none of these bleeps in, in our neighborhood or in our schools. It could have been well-meaning people that may be even related to me via a hundred corners. Who did that? Why am I saying that? Because this is something that I have sadly missed and have not seen happen in the countries outside of Germany that I've lived. From Germany I moved to England. The British nation, the great British nation, never really seems to touch me as a group of people who fully acknowledge what they bequeathed to the world. The idea of European superiority, superiority, the idea of imperialism, all of that and herding people into camps concentrating them in camps. That's a British invention. Germans only took that over and perfected it. But I never heard that. I never saw that. I never really saw an acknowledgement that, yes, we did that. No, it was always rule Britannia. Britannia rule the waves. Britain never, never be enslaved. And then I moved from England via Bermuda now to New Jersey, the United States of America. And on Black History Month, I see a lot of things where, you know, I see grainy black and white footage from Selma, Alabama, and from Montgomery, Alabama. And I see Dr. King preaching on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And I see all this. And yet I don't see white Americans standing up and saying, these people who are behind the fence, who are behind the cordon, who hold the placards with the nasty words, who are screaming at the little girl going to, going to her school in, 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 uh, and the, the others in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, these are the people that could have been us. No, what I see is, is, is a quasi-denial and a shrinking away from the responsibility to live up to your history. And so the thing of Fagai's Bewältigung, to come to terms with your own history, is something that I had to learn painfully, yes, over the years as a German. It's something that I offer freely as a painful but very rewarding process to my American brothers and sisters. Because if God is a God of justice and righteousness, if God is interested in how we tell history and do it with the least amount of bias and balance or imbalance, so keep it in balance, that's what I mean, then I can't just focus on the victims and say, oh, so bad, how millions and millions of Africans were enslaved and, 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 and were sent on those ships and most of them died in passage or were thrown overboard and those that survived and made it over to the so-called new world, they didn't live longer than a year or two before they were ground into the, you know, literally ground into death in the plantations of the Caribbean or in Brazil or in the southern states. I can't just focus on that. Because history is a complete picture. Who sailed those ships? Who benefited from the prophets? Who set up the system? Who drank the sugar that was produced in those plantations? Who wore the clothes that was made from the cotton that was produced on those plantations? Who smoked the cigarettes and cigars that came out of those areas? Who profited from this inhumane and barbaric and sinful trade of human beings and their exploitation. And then all of a sudden I realized that it was average Joes like me who 200 years ago benefited from that. And it doesn't matter where on the Mason-Dixon line I fall, north or south of it, we all benefited from it. That's part of Vergangenheitsbewältigung. 
to simply acknowledge the fact that that's what happened. And no, I cannot claim the moral high ground and identify myself with the victims because I am a European white male. I was on this side of the perpetrators. And if I had lived two or three hundred years ago, who knows what I would have done? Who knows what I would have said? Who knows where I would have worked? It's part of Vergangenheitsbewältigung. And it's moments like this when we, when we, when we, for one month in the year, and maybe who knows, in the times to come, maybe uh, Morgan Freeman's vision will become a reality where there is no more need for Black History Month because now we tell American history in all of its shades. And we realized that Buffalo Bill was just some crazy old fool who liked to slaughter innocent and, and, and defenseless animals on the Western Plains. And by doing so, he pulled from under their feet the rug of their existence. And so the fate of the American Indians or the First Nations inhabitants in the Great Plains of the West was sealed. But now we like to play cowboys and Indians and we think it's fun and games, but it's not. Because we had been brainwashed by a media and by a culture that sees the white man heading west as the great hero who, plan, who rides into great, the great unknown and claims the territory for civilization. But we don't talk about those who were there before we got there. We don't talk about how we now still treat the descendants of those that were slaughtered and were captured and were forced into reservations. We don't talk about the high unemployment rate of Native Americans and their increase, I mean, their incredible high alcohol consumption and their early deaths. Because we destroyed their culture. No, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about how just 10 miles from here in Camden, we still see late legacy of slavery right at work in our backyard. Don't even have to cross over to Philly, but it's just as bad. Oh, we say, no, that's because these people don't want to work or because there's some economical reasons. Yeah, but if you trace it far enough back, if you trace it far enough back, where does that come from? What is the long-term legacy of segregation of Jim Crow and before that slavery? Oh, I have easy to, I can easily preach because I'm from a country where I have a long, rich history. Well, minus the 12 years of, of this. But if I deny this, if I deny what happened between 33 and 45, I'm lying to myself and I'm unjust to history and so I have to do this. And in the same way, when we talk about Black History Month, when we talk about history in the church even, I'm coming to that in a moment, and don't worry, there's a spiritual message in this message. <laughs> and yet when I come here, I see the same denial that I see in some of the... No, let me not go down that road. To deal with my past, I have to first acknowledge that it happened. And then I have to see if there's anything left over because I can't change what happened. I can't go back to 1945. I wish I had a time machine. I would fly back to the 1980s and tell Mr. and Mrs. Um, oh, what were their names now? Because Hitler had a really funny name before he took on Hitler. Anyway, I would go back there and say, um, sure you don't want to give up the child for adoption? If that doesn't work, then I would have gone to Vienna and I would have told, pleaded with the art, with the, with the art institute, take this man and teach him how to paint. I know his paintings are not so good. Careful here what I'm saying as I'm church, right? I know they they I know they're not that good. But please take him in. Give him a life in art. Because Hitler was a failed artist. Maybe I should have gone back to World War I and instead of him getting wounded by shrapnel, make sure there's a sniper who takes him out. But that's a bit violent. You see where I'm going with this. We can't go back and change history. What we have to do is live with the legacy of that history and work on what has to be done, justice and righteousness and otherwise um, 
about the legacies of, these, of, of this history. If I benefited from slave labor in 1941, 2, 3, 4, before they blew up my concentration camp, before the Red Army got a little too close to comfort or the Americans from the West, if I benefited from that, then yes, I better make sure that in my budget post-World War II, I have some money to pay to the descendants of the people that did that. That's called corporate responsibility in the face of history. And I leave you all to draw your own conclusions from that. Vergangenheitsbewältigung is to do with acknowledging it happened, deal with the consequences of what happened, and in acknowledging, in acknowledging, sorry, acknowledge the fact that you may be on the side of the people that don't look quite so good. Now, what does it have to do with the church? Let me move on here. What does it have to do with the church? Because, as I said four weeks ago when we introduced this topic, in church we are not isolated and insulated from what's happening around us. And so, what happens in the United States comes here into church. The values and, and the, the, the culture that we grow up in, we carry that into church. That's why Elder Joe is sitting here in a suit and a tie. Because that is a cultural attire to wear to come to church. Well, you, you don't believe that? In two weeks, we all come in t-shirt and jeans. Now a bit too, warm, too cold, sin. Now, in, in the summer, we'll do that in the summer. So we bring that, we bring things in here because just by virtue of having grown up or, or, or now having lived in for long enough in this country. And so when, help me Lord, our church, and I'm talking just to us Adventists, our denomination drank from the Kool-Aid of prevalent society in the late 1800s, in the early 1900s. We drank of the Kool-Aid of Reconstruction and Jim Crow. We drank of the Kool-Aid of lawful and law-enforced segregation. We drank of the Kool-Aid of all of that. Did you know that in 1947, a light-skinned woman by the name of Lucy Bryant was admitted to the Washington Adventist Hospital? We have a lot of Adventist hospitals around the world. Praise God for our health system. But in 1947, this woman was admitted to hospital. And she was admitted because she was very fair. And so when they found out that she was indeed not white, that she was black, although very light-skinned, but she was black, they decided we can't treat you here because it is not lawful to treat you in this hospital because this is a whites only hospital so you have to go across town to be treated in the hospital where blacks are treated. Unfortunately for Lucy Bryant, in the transfer she caught pneumonia and she died as a result of not getting treatment in the whites only hospital, our Adventist hospital. Those are my brothers and sisters who did that. There's an Adventist doctor who said we can't treat her here. Because they were afraid of man's laws, but were not afraid of God's law that says there's no favoritism with me. Amen. This morning in Bible study, we discussed how the Pharisees would have pulled out a donkey when it landed in the ditch because they valued that beast of burden because there was money invested in that. And yet my own brothers and sisters were too afraid of Jim Crow and let that woman die. I could go on and on and on about that. Because not all is well in Adventism even today. We're still working on this because we have not done Vergangenheitsbewältigung even in this church. When was the last time a general conference president stood we have, um, uh, every five years, I'll explain this for the non-adventists, every five years we have a world synod, a worldwide gathering with representatives from all over the globe because Adventists are all over, one denomination, and we come together every five years. It's a big thing, we call it the general conference session. 
when did I ever hear a GC president, that's the, that's the main guy, the president of our worldwide denomination, when have we ever seen him stand up and do this? I have never heard or read in printing some Adventist pastor, and I know by now my chances of ever going through the ranks, have this, they've vanished now. now. This is it now, Burton Schnull. You've cast your lot. This is it. You're going to stay a local pastor if that. I have never seen anybody except once in 2000, Elder McClure, who was the president of the division that includes North America. He tried to set up and did set up what was called a race summit. And there, for just a brief moment, I saw my church acknowledging that not all is well, even in Adventism, when it comes to race relations. But it was just one little... That was it. So we cried our tears, and we done our penance, and we said we're sorry. And 14 years later, we still behave and speak as if all is well. As if nothing ever happened because, well, we did acknowledge certain things then, did we? But did you know that, well, he's left now, Elder Calvin, um, one of the elders we prayed for earlier. 80 years ago, or 70 years ago, or just around the war time, in the 40s, let's say in the 40s, if Elder Calvin and I had been alive in the 40s, and we would have traveled to Washington, D.C., to go to Tacoma Park, to visit our world headquarters of Seventh-day Adventists, and then after visiting there, talking with the brethren, we now want to eat lunch. I would be able to walk into the cafeteria to have my lunch, but Elder Calvin would have to stay outside, because the cafeteria of the General Conference was segregated. This was our people. This was my history as an Adventist pastor. We did this because we were afraid of human law that said that separate but equal. And yet we're not afraid of God's law that said I have no favorites and I want you to be the salt and the light of the world. Amen. So um, one of the great scholars and administrators of the Adventist Church, African-American Calvin Rock, wrote a book or edited a book called Perspectives. And in this book, there's a, it's a collection of papers. And one of the papers was written by Ricardo Graham, who is now the president of the Pacific Union Conference, which is Adventist churches in the West. Pacific Union, right? North. No, this is all California and all of that stuff over there. And in this book, he writes this. I'm going to quote, and then this will end the church bit, and then we come to the personal bit where you all breathe easy because we can finally go spiritual. We've already been spiritual since I started. Ella Graham writes this. The first step in improving race relations in the Seventh-day Adventist church is for the denomination to acknowledge that there is a serious problem. In regard to racism in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, there is a strong sense of denial. This is because the church has never, in its publications or programs, admitted to the existence of racism within its confines, nor has it devised programs or strategies to deal effectively with racism. Before there can be a change in behavior, there must first be an acknowledgement that there is a problem. There needs to be a mature inquiry and a straightforward diagnosis and prognosis of the malady. I wish I could preach like this guy writes, mercy. This process has been missing within Adventism on any broad scale. One reason is that there is pain involved in this process. The pain of admitting that the true church has been untrue with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
To avoid this pain, the SDA denomination has engaged in a form of self-deception in the field of race relations. Leaders and administrators throughout the church have avoided addressing this issue effectively, thus weakening the witness of this denomination." End quote. Black History Month gives me the opportunity, even from this pulpit, to bring to our attention that to deal with one's past includes our nation's history, includes our church's history, warts and all. But in the final analysis, it started with me as a young man in Germany coming to terms with my nation's history. And so this sermon ends again with my history, no longer as a German. No, now as a sinner. Because if I have to come to terms with my history, the history of my country, if I have to come to terms with the history of my church, then I have to come to terms with my personal history. And that history finished just 20 seconds ago. So how do I deal with the warts and all in my personal life? Or would I be able to wax lyrical and speak about Germans and their concentration camps and all these nasty things and in Black History Month show videos that put roots to the shame and go through all of this and yet I deny my own personal history. The Bible says in Romans that all have sinned, all have fallen short of righteousness and of the glory of God. But in the closing moments of this sermon, if acknowledgement is the first step, acknowledging, confessing as it were, that it happened, warts and all, if that is the first step to deal with my country's history, if that is the first step in dealing with my church's history, then it is also the first step in dealing with my history. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, tells us how we are made right with God. The first step, the condition of being made right with God is to not deny that it happened. But John says, if we confess our sins, then he is righteous and just to forgive us our sins and better still to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God does not just deal with your bad thought just now or last week or yesterday. He wants to deal with the whole of your sinful past. If we confess. And what else than acknowledging and putting myself in the picture is confession. It is saying to God that I did it. I'm not that good. I may have even fooled myself into thinking that I was all that. But really, I'm not. In the conflict between you, God, and me, ego, as we said in, re you know, in response to your song, my ego has the last word. Even if I've been in church for how many years? Even if I had all the theological training there is, even if I'm paid by a denomination to be a pastor, even if I've been an elder or held office, even if I sit on a million and one committees, even if I think I've done it all right. Really? There are those moments when myself, when I want to increase and you, Jesus, decrease. That's confession. To take a look in the proverbial mirror and says, <laughs> yeah, I'm not all that pretty, am I? 
have had victories and yes, have had succession, successes. Just like country and church's history is a mixed bag. I only highlighted the bad things this morning. There's a lot of good stuff that happened in both church and country. And there's a lot of good things that happened in my personal life. But there are the warts. There are the defeats. There are the failures. There are the things that I wish I could deny but I can't. I can hide it from everybody else except the one who sees everything and looks at me as if I was made of glass. If we confess, he is faithful. He forgives us our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Two more texts. One leads to the other. Second Corinthians chapter 5 gives us the hope that although bad things happened, they are not a determinant, determin, they are not the determining force of what necessarily has to happen in the future. Because in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17, we read this. This is Paul writing to the church, to us. Therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, Aha, if anyone is in Christ, huh? the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Do you want to know why I can talk about German history so easily? Because my self-worth, my self-identity is not bound up in my national nationality. I have a German passport, I have a German history and, and heritage, yes, that's the group I was born into on this planet. But my identity, my self-worth is not there anymore. Do you know why I can talk about slavery and I can watch Roots with my black family without crawling into a space of shame and hiding under the sofa? And I'm not the one who can identify with Kunta Kinte. No, I'm the one who is whipping him. Do you know why I can do that? Because my self-identity, my self-worth is not bound up in what society labels me, a white guy, Caucasian, whatever you want to call it. Because Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's where my identity is. In Christ. I can talk about this without feeling any personal detriment and shame because, yes, it happened, but I'm not bound to this any longer because I am now in Christ. And in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. So I can do Vergangenheitsbewältigung as a white male, German and all, because while I grew up there, while I look like this and still benefit from it because white privilege is still alive and well, but that's for next year's Black History Month. My identity is now in Christ. And then he says, the old is gone and the new is here. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Reconciliation is God's gift to me. I have to respond by confessing that I'm not all that. And with his willingness to forgive, and with my repentance and confession, together we are now reconciled. All the old things have passed. All things are new. Isaiah 43, our, our memory text, um, our, Bible, our scripture reading. Getting my church lingo mixed up. Our scripture reading. This is where we started four weeks ago. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. 
Now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The old is gone. The new is here. I am making a new thing. And he ends there by saying streams in the wilderness. And while I said only two more Bible verses, here comes the extra one, the two plus one. <laughs> streams in the wilderness. Amos 5 verse 24. So let justice roll like a river. Righteousness like a never ending or failing stream. That's what God wants to do in us. And he starts with me, my personal history. And he moves from me to my church's history. A new thing will come. Streams in the wilderness. Justice rolling on like a river in the church. And then who knows, from my church, it may even have an impact on the country. So if you want to say to God this, this, this um, afternoon now, gosh, if you want to say to God, well, Lord, okay, it has to start with me. As I pray, I don't make, you know, stay in your seats. This is just for you and God. As I pray, just stretch your hand up to God. Nobody's looking. Just close our eyes in prayer. Nobody's looking. Just stretch your hand to God. If you want to be part of this. Lord, we stretch our hands to you, confessing that we're not all that. There's stuff in our selfishness still hiding in the corners, coming out. And we're not all that. But this morning, Lord, we confess as you look into our lives, you see that we want to we are willing to give it to give it up to you. We may have to live with the consequences. We may have to do something about it. We may have to right some wrongs that we committed. But right now, Lord, on the personal level, we just want to say, yep, we did it. And so start Vergangenheitsbewältigung in our own lives. Lord, when you finish with us individually, then help us to see how we can let justice and righteousness roll in this church. Not just in this congregation here, in Cherry Hill, but in our denomination as Adventists around New Jersey and around North America. And who knows where you will take us? I don't. You are God. You know. And finally, Lord, when next February comes around, and I only preach this morning from the view of a white immigrant in North America, but when Black History Month comes around again, or when we are confronted with the painful and unsavory bits of American history, Lord, give us the strength and the identity and security to look at it and say, yep, that really happened. And I, was, I, I identify with this part or with that part, but I no longer deny it happened. I'm no longer running away from the painful bits. And who knows, maybe when we've been through this progress, then you can use us to teach somebody else who's still in need of it. But it starts this morning, the afternoon, with us. Starting with my own personal history. Lord, all to you we surrender. Everything there is. All to you we freely give. We will ever love and trust you in your presence daily live so Lord take our lives take our confessions and replace the old sinful with the new righteous and replace the old selfish with the new just and selfless and let your river roll and flow in me and let your stream of righteousness roll on like a never-failing stream. Amen.